Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for, um, thank you and both congratulations for making the right choice to come to one of the most important sessions here at the Aspen Ideas Festival. Congratulations. This is, um, I have to say, this is one, uh, by the way, I'm Ann Mosley. I'm a vice president here with the Aspen Institute. I'm the founding executive director of Ascend, which is a policy program focused on creating an intergenerational cycle of opportunity. My other hat that I wear with my colleague Peggy Clark and our phenomenal teams is I serve as co-chair of the Aspen Forum on Women and Girls, which is a joint platform across programs to lift up the potential power of women and girls from the Aspen Institute and all the many networks. So just another piece here to um, help move the movement. Um, this is a really important conversation and a chance for us to go deeper with some extraordinary leaders. Um, and I'm going to kick it over to them in one second. What the team of ideas has designed for you all is a three-part deep dive. We're going to look at the story of Me Too. We're going to think about the people's movement. We're going to think about strategies and some um, great statistics. So um, with no further ado, the one thing I want to say is make sure your cell phones are off, because you'd be so mortified if that were you and you interrupt like this brilliance. Um, and then make sure you are tweeting away, hashtag Aspen Ideas, and hashtag Me Too, too. So um, with no further ado, it is my uh, pleasure to introduce Rebecca Traster, who is one of the most compelling, clear, fabulous writers out there, Woo -hoo! contributing editor for New York Magazine. Um, State Senator Sarah Gess Gessler, who I just met um, from Oregon, doing some phenomenal work. Um, and then also a dear friend and colleague who I've known for way too long, and she is just setting the world on fire, Ajim Poo, who has just um, a very uh, special uh, uh, speaker on this program who also really brought the heart and soul from the end of the spotlight in health, and I'm just saying channel that energy on in from the border throughout, um, how we are allies in this together. So as you start this Me Too deep dive, open your hearts, open your mind, and let's get started. Rebecca. Thank you so much, um, and thanks to everybody for coming. Anne kind of did the introductions, but just slightly more formally, Ajahn Poo is the executive director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance and the co-director of Caring Across Generations, and Sarah Gelser is a state senator from Oregon uh, who has focused primarily on child welfare and disability rights in her career as a politician. And I think the conversation that we are aiming to have here today is to get at some of the more structural and systemic aspects of the conversation around Me Too. And I'm going to start with Ijen uh, asking you a little bit about how the Me Too movement as it has re-exploded um, over the past eight months, uh, merges with the work that you've been doing with domestic workers and how these stories are part of a, the same story. Great. Uh, can you all hear me? Um, thanks again for coming out. Um, so I work with the workforce that works in our homes every day, um, caring for our children as nannies, caring for our aging parents and our loved ones with disabilities as home care workers, um, cleaning and maintaining sanity in our chaotic homes as house cleaners. Um, and so this workforce, if you think about it, it's almost defined by invisibility because you could go into any neighborhood or apartment building and not know which homes are also workplaces. And it's a workforce that's vast majority women and it's work that's associated with work that women have historically done, right, cleaning and caregiving. Um, and so it's like this uh, very highly gendered work environment and industry, and disproportionately women of color and immigrant women who do this work. And if you think about it, it's usually one worker per employee, in, um, per workplace. And so there's no water cooler, no HR department, and no, um, no coworkers, no one to talk to, to ask questions. Um, and so there's just this high degree of vulnerability. And it's also compounded by the fact that uh, domestic work and farm work were two industries that have been systematically excluded from almost every major labor protection that most of us take for granted when we go to work every day. And that exclusion dates back to the 1930s, to the New Deal, when a lot of these laws were put into place, when Southern members of Congress refused to support um, labor protections for farm workers and domestic workers who were mostly African-American at the time. 
So this history of race and how race plays into the protections that exist and the way that we value work. And then this association with women's work and the way that we've culturally devalued this work and the practicality of the fact that there's such high vulnerability and isolation doing this work has just meant that this workforce has been highly vulnerable to abuse. Um, we often compare it to the Wild West where you don't quite know what you're gonna get. You might find a wonderful family that you stay with for generations, and then on the other end of the spectrum there's human trafficking, rape and sexual assault, and everything in between. Right? No real standards or guidelines. And so it's in that environment that we've started to understand the ways in which exclusions, cultural norms, um, really reflect how we value work and workers systematically, a system and a culture that actually fundamentally values women's work and women's contributions in the economy less. Your answer makes explicit something that I feel has very often been lost in the coverage of Me Too and in some of the pushback to it. There is a popular idea that when we're talking about Me Too and challenging um, norms of power abuse that entail sexual harassment, it is cast as a story about sex and about sexual harm. And so, and that's how you get some of the anxieties about it, that it's gonna become a Victorian sex panic, that it's about mushing all kinds of varieties and degrees of sexual harm in one bu bucket. And I think what your answer gets to that I wanna be really clear about here is that the thing that is often missed is that there's a category error in how we're understanding what the story about is about because it's about power abuses within a workplace. And that is why some of the policies that you're talking about that theoretically, what do they have to do with sexual harassment? Like fair wages and paid overtime, paid sick days, family leave, the, the legislation around discrimination. Can you be clear about how those kinds of conversations and policy ideas have a direct correlation to questions around sexual harassment and vulnerability and discrimination at a work, in a workplace? Well, you know, I think pay inequity, vulnerability to sexual harassment, um, lack of access to basic protections, these are all symptoms of a larger economic framework which values women and women's work less. And the beautiful thing that I was gonna say though about the Me Too moment is the thing that we've seen is that in this moment, courage is absolutely contagious and so as we've seen women in the entertainment industry and women in media and women in all of these different industries speak out and in very visible ways, it has actually sparked and enforced courage across industries. And so this issue of sexual harassment has been one that's been very difficult for our workforce to talk about, even in behind closed doors of our meetings. When we do story sharing circles, it's the one thing that has been hardest to kind of bring forward. And I would say that this new moment where we're actually really telling our stories and we're seeing that story and truth telling happen everywhere, it is actually driving um, a new level of courage and I think ultimately a new breakthrough in our culture where we won't go back. The, the fact that you bring up the courage in storytelling um, actually brings me straight to Senator Gelser, Sarah, who herself is somebody who told a story and I'm gonna ask you to recount for the audience what happened and from a, from a perspective of theoretically more power. Um, as a state senator, she told a story about one of her colleagues um, and in theory should have had more power than some of the domestic workers who you represent who are in places of professional and economic vulnerability. Um, but can you talk a little bit about your experience of telling the story that you did and then what systems came into play in reaction to your telling that story? Absolutely, thank you. So I first began having some encounters with this particular legislator many years ago. And for several years, just kind of lived with it as the idea of this is the price 
of working in this workplace. This is what this is like. Um, one of the first times that it occurred to me that I was participating in this construct, I was actually working on the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, and I didn't like going to meet with this person who told me he would help me with it. And he asked for a meeting one day, and generally I would dress differently if I was going to go and meet with him. And I asked my staff, should I still go? And she's like, well, I guess it depends on how much you want the bill. And uh, I recounted that story to my daughters that evening who are part of this rising electorate of 18 year olds. They're like, mom, you would just go nuts if, if we tolerated, if we tolerated that. But I continued to do so, just avoided him. Um, but finally, by 2016, I made a complaint. Um, they investigated, they found it was true, they told him to stop touching women, other people made complaints, and he didn't. So to me, it was just reinforced that this is the way it is, we have to live with it. So in October of 2017, um, after the Harvey Weinstein story broke, uh, the Republican Senate Communications Director started tweeting at me that I was this supporter of Harvey Weinstein, who I frankly had never heard of because I'm really geeky and I'm not good at entertainment, um, and that I had taken all this money from him, which I had not, and I retorted back in a tweet, the power of the tweet, what's your caucus going to do to make sure that your members aren't inappropriately touching the women in the building? And that kind of created um, this, this firestorm. I ended up filing a formal complaint. Um, at that time, what just really struck me was the number of young women in the building that came to me to tell me of the same experiences they had had with this man. And I felt immediately just overwhelming guilt that I had had power to speak up, and they didn't because they could get fired. I could not. In this case, we had senators that had witnessed the behavior and talked about it. We had it on videotape multiple times, inappropriate touching on the Senate floor. We had an independent investigator that, um, that identified and substantiated these allegations that he was a serial harasser that had multiple victims, including two young law interns, one of whom changed the way she dressed. The other one left her internship early because she could no longer take being called sexy little girl, being touched in these ways. And yet, even though we knew that, the legislature did nothing and could do nothing to keep him from the building and stop putting women in front of him. The only way for that to happen is for the Senate to take a two-thirds vote through a conduct committee. And because of a fear of politics, almost everyone was afraid to come out and say this man should resign. I kept being told that it had to be a process. It had to be a process. He, he eventually negotiated his ability to leave. Where he got to preserve his per diem, he got paid for another two months on the agreement that he would not come into the building and he got to avoid the conduct committee. When he left, his caucus statement was that he had been a very fine legislator, that everybody deserves due process, and of course, if the allegations were true, they would have been unacceptable. Democratic um, caucus staff said, we believe the women. But to me, that was one of the things in the end. For the women that were in, that were unnamed, Republican staffers, I don't know that this was an empowering process to them because we had video, we had an independent investigator, we had multiple witnesses, and still people said this was for political gain, this was partisan, this is because Sarah wants to run for Congress, this is because people want their names in the newspaper. Nobody runs on being sexually harassed, and I'm telling you, I did not like turning on the radio and listening to stories about my breast. It's just not fun. I'd rather talk about child welfare. Right. You. <laughs> that story encompasses so many important points about how the power dynamics work in this, and ultimately, this is a story about power and power differentials. And one of the first points you make is this question of, I need him for this bill. Do I risk the bill and the greater good in exchange for feeling like I'm not going to be harassed? Or, and, and I think that brings up this, and, and it's certainly at the heart of some of the stuff you're describing about domestic workers and, and the professional situations they encounter. Dependency is a structural reality that we have to think about when we think about sexual harassment and when we think about gendered and racial and class inequity. Because in systems where one group has power in economic, political, social, professional spheres, other people become dependent on them as workers, as representatives. And I wonder if you, and it, it, there's a cost to those who are dependent on them in challenging them. You risk the things that you depend on them for. 
your income, your job, your promotions, the ideas that they're going to advocate for politically. Can you talk a little bit about that, the, the position that people are put in when they want to challenge a power that is abusive, the risks that they take? Well, a, a couple things before this mm -hmm. question. Um, I, th I find it still so amazing that women are uh, more than half the electorate, more than half the workforce, 70% uh, of the com consumer base in this country, more than half of all college graduates, and women's issues and women's interests are really still treated as kind of a special interest, mm -hmm. right? And um, when really our experiences are defining of the whole experience of the economy and democracy and, and life in this country. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is a real reflection of this power imbalance that you talk about. Um, and I think that what we're seeing right now with the level of activation and organizing that's happening among women is that people are saying no more that we are done with this power imbalance and we're gonna work together to try to not only disrupt it, but transform it for the good of all, really. And that includes everything. <laughs> yes, we are. Um, and it includes everything from, you know, the, the fact that 30,000 women have raised their hand to sign up to run for office, right? In many instances, people who've never voted before realizing I am the leader that I've been waiting for and really stepping up. Incredible organizing on everything from sexual harassment to public education and mass incarceration. Like, women were 86% of the calls to save our healthcare to Congress. Like, I think we are realizing that we have to take matters into our own hands. And if we wanna change this power imbalance, we have to build our power together. And, and I would say part of, of building that power is recognizing the constructs that have um, stood in the way of women and other groups claiming that power in the past. And one of them is the call to be polite. Mm. Um, that it is impolite to call somebody out on their negative behavior. It could be, it could look bad for the institution. It could look bad for the church. It could reflect badly on the show. It would really lead to a very uncomfortable Thanksgiving dinner. Can't you just be polite? Well, I would say there is absolutely nothing polite about sexually harassing someone, about inappropriately touching someone. And we have to step back from this place where we all are supposed to be polite in the face of, of things that are simply inhumane. And that plays out not just in Me Too, but across all movements. This call to be polite in the face of human rights violations at our borders is absolutely unthinkable. It is not the time to be polite. It is the time to do the right thing. Do you see, we're, I mean, that comment, what we're talking about are all of these kinds of fights merging. And I'm wondering, as somebody who's done a lot of thinking and reading about the history of the women's movement, the civil rights movement, of uh, certainly racism within the women's movement, sexism within civil rights movements, homophobia within both of those movements, um, I, is, and, and so many resistance movements have been hobbled by the kind of internal inequities that plague them and slow them down. And of course, we see a lot now about the divisions within the resistance, within the movements. But it also feels to me, and I want to know how the both of you feel about this, that we're actually seeing conversation and a sort of civic education and um, acknowledgement of these inequities within these movements and we're, there's a kind of understanding how they interlock in a way that hasn't been true before. Is that something that you guys agree with at this point? Do you see how these things are merging in a way that's productive? I, I think that's true. I think people are more conscious about how their behaviors, even well-intentioned behaviors, can be marginalizing to other groups mm -hmm. of people. And how to be in integrity with pushing back against one injustice, you have to be there for all others. Uh, an example I read this week on a very much smaller scale, some of you may have read the viral article about the man who experienced um, sensory disability. He was both blind and deaf 
flying on an airplane uh, to Portland alone. And there was a, a young woman, a 15-year-old, who spoke sign language who interpreted for him. So what I saw deconstructed about that that I thought was really good was, one, why was this centered on the experience of the other people on the airplane? And did anybody ask this man his permission before his story was spread out anywhere? And secondly, uh, one of the elements of the story was that the guy asked the seatmate if the girl was pretty. And the seatmate said, oh, yes, she's very pretty. And it was, why was that appropriate? That's just creepy. It doesn't matter who says that. Adults don't call 15-year-olds pretty in that, in that context. But to me, that was a piece of, of disability, gender, me too, and centering the experience of, of people where they have the power of their story, which I think is important. We cannot push people out um, in a spotlight to make a change if that's not where they want to be or where they can be and if it's not safe for them. And I, I agree. I, I also think that there's been a lot of work that's been seeded over many, many years that has developed leaders like Tarana Burke, who you're going to hear from, um, and leaders who have resisted being siloed into one issue area, one identity, and instead really pushed us to look at all the different ways in which power is shaping our lives. You hear this word intersectionality quite a bit. All intersectionality is is a tool to help us understand that there are lots of dimensions to power that actually shape our lives. And if we try to look for all of them, we actually better understand how power is operating, and then we can better understand how we can change it. Right? And so the starting point for many of the people who are working on the border right now to try to defend and protect children who are there and families are people who are part of the domestic violence movement, right? The feminist movement. There are all kinds of movements that are converging to say this, what's at stake here is about our, our shared humanity. And we can't concede on this dimension because it actually affects all of us. And so that's the kind, I think that's the new starting point. And it's been seeded over many years by many, many organizations and movements. And I think we now accept that as the starting point. And I think the first Women's March was a reflection of that where basically we had millions of people together in the street on one day and there were signs about every issue under the sun and there was room for all of it. We weren't forced to choose, it wasn't a hierarchy, it was like we were trying to be fully human and fully humanize, of course imperfectly, it's always a work in progress, but fully humanize everyone so that, um, so that we can start to really undo the way that power is organized to try to put one group of people over other and another in terms of their human value. I want to ask one more question before we throw it to the audience for some questions, so think about what you want to ask. Um, I want to ask about the different value and utility of individual stories versus systemic and cultural critique. Um, it's obviously individual stories, the ability for individuals to say, me too, that open this conversation up. But I know that, Sarah, you, you have been quoted as saying, this isn't just, this isn't about my experience, it's actually about culture. Can you talk about these two sort of competing ways into this conversation? I think individual stories um, provide a, a pathway to understanding the social constructs that we all live in. So an individual can tell a story that might resonate with someone else, and, and they can think about how they've had that experience in their life as well. But if we make it about Harvey Weinstein, or we make it about, um, you know, the, my guy, you make it about any of these people, you really miss the point. What it's about is the equity and humanity of all people. It's the ability to not walk through life believing, and I think many of us have been raised to believe this, that as women, some people just have the right to touch us. And we're supposed to tolerate that to a certain point. To a certain point, that's acceptable. And we will be polite and allow that to happen. And then we'll push back. This is about that idea of bodily integrity and personal integrity. 
and it's about the people that cannot speak up about that. Mm -hmm. So for all the, the actors and the politicians, what I am really concerned about are the domestic workers, the farm workers, the individual who works in the restaurant where her patron is grabbing her butt every day and she can't say anything because she needs to buy um, shoes for her daughter. That is the, until we change the culture, we don't get there by flushing out the monsters. We have to flush out the entire culture and change the system in which we live so that we all have uh, the autonomy we deserve. I agree. <laughs> Uh, look, we hit exactly. No, I would love it if we can probably answer several questions. So, who has questions? Yes. Oh, <laughs> there is a mic that's going to come around. Okay. Hi, my name is Matthew Garcia, and I'm one of the Bezos scholars. And my hey. question who do you want to first? Hey. <laughs> is in the light of this current um, frame of our country, where mo a good chunk of the country is very distrustful of journalism and the honest reporting of facts. How is the Me Too movement really trying to spread their message and to reach the people who really need to hear it the most? Um, well, <laughs> I actually think that in this era of anxiety about journalism, the Me Too reporting and, and some of it, I mean, beginning with the incredible stories about Weinstein in the New York Times and in the New Yorker, um, and the kind of reporting that was done in me, by many institutions um, starting in early October of 2017, and it's still ongoing, um, has been some of the best, most thoroughly reported, most carefully documented, knowing how incendiary this was. I mean, this is some of the most exquisite journalism that I've seen <laughs> um, because these things are notoriously difficult. These kinds of stories are notoriously difficult to, to report, and I think that your question actually gets something to something that I think has been a bit of good news in terms of how the press is regarded, which is that that journalism was the explosive tool. It was trusted by enough people to permit the movement to flourish, to steam forward, to open doors for other people to tell stories, to open doors to, to get new approaches to what we do about it. Um, and it was journalism that was one of the earliest tools in, uh, also in line with social media and people being able to say me too and talk to their friends and their compatriots and, and tell their stories in unmediated ways. The journalism was the heart of it and so much of it was unimpeachable um, that it's actually a terrific story about the utility and, and world changing power of good journalism even in an era where it's, the, its public perception is so precarious. So I think me too is actually a happy journalism story. I would add to that I think that there's what's factually true and what's emotionally true. And they're not the same. <laughs> and, um, and yet both are part of our realities. And, um, and I think that we have to account for the, the, um, the emotional dimension of how we experience and understand the world. And one of the things about what is happening now around sexual harassment and sexual <laughs> violence is this movement and cultural transformation has been driven by personal storytelling and the, the cur courage of survivors who are willing to, to really speak their truths and then the stage that those stories are given and the power of those stories to reach people and catalyze transformation in our culture, that um, courage is contagious piece, right? That there's something, there's an emotional connection we have to the stories of survivors that really emboldens the rest of us as survivors and also um, really calls on us to start changing the way that we um, think, feel, and act. And I think that that's at the root of a lot of the work, the survivor leadership development work that Toronto has been doing over many, many years has been about really understanding the power of that leadership and those stories and that courage to catalyze change. So we need the journalism and we need the leadership of survivors, right, in this yeah. moment. Yeah. Thank you. One more question. Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, 
Um, my name's Emily. Um, I, I do think we're having a cultural reckoning here, and I think it's lo obviously long needed, and it's great. I, I'm hopeful that policy will catch up. Um, I do think it comes right, you know, right at the edge of, as we start to think, we've been pushing, you know, we called it, you know, five, six years ago, we called it lean in, you know, we called it like women in the workplace. And you've all been um, addressing correctly that this is about power structure and not necessarily about, you know, I think correctly about, about you know, the, the sex of it. But in the, very recently, in the last couple of weeks, I've even heard it here, people sort of talking about women in the workplace, calling all of it Me Too. Um, and so I kind of wonder about, when we think about where we're going, um, how do we think about that? Like, how do we address that? You know, not, not every issue for women in the workplace is necessarily tied to harassment. Um, and so how do we think about those things, especially as the, this has the correct platform that it should, as it didn't before? Well, I, I don't think it's the responsibility of the Me Too movement to consolidate everything into to one problem. There are many um, structural, systemic um, tools to the patriarchy and, um, and to, to keeping certain people out of power and to minimizing other, other people. That, that is just true, and one hashtag cannot, cannot fix that. I worry a little bit that, that those worries um, can be used, I'm not suggesting that you're doing this, but what I'm hearing in the backlash, to minimize the experiences uh, that, that people have, to say, well, that, that doesn't count. That's, that's not me too enough. Um, that doesn't uh, climb up on the, on the level of um, violation to be something that you should speak out about. If you talk about that, you're gonna destroy it for all the other women. I think we have to be careful about that and recognize that it really is about people claiming their own space and being able to say what they are, what they are comfortable with. If I don't like the way that you've touched me, that's, that's all that matters. I get to decide. You don't get to decide. Um, and, and that's, I think, what people are, are struggling with a lot. And I think at the end of the day, regardless of what we call it, what we're trying to do is change the culture and the economy, um, the way that it's structured, to actually value women as fully um, human and equal. Um, and so <laughs> that's, I think, um, and I think there's been like, is it about the workplace? Is it about, and I think it's really about our, our lives and whether we're at work or in the community, being able to live with safety and dignity and autonomy. Um, and how do we get there? Um, it, it'll take many organizations and campaigns and hashtags and right, but that at the end of the day, I think that's where we're all trying to get to. Can I say I, one more thing about the culture? Y yes, yes. So I, I think in the culture too, one of the issues that keeps coming up that I hear a lot about is Al Franken, and that that's not really a Me Too moment because of that photograph. That was just supposed to be funny. To me, that that crystallizes why the culture needs to change. There's absolutely nothing funny about rape or sexual assault. Not this year, not last year, not ever. That never, ever should be funny. But we have a culture that tells women it's supposed to be funny and we're supposed to play into those jokes. That's, it's not funny. <laughs> I, love that, I love that you opened the Franken can of worms with 17 seconds left. <laughs> um, the, and unfortunately, we literally only have seconds left, so we can't go further, though I think we would love to. Um, I, I also wanted to say in response to this that one of the remarkable things about this moment and covering it as a journalist is that there's a hunger that's been awakened to talk about sexism, and it's very, very hard. One of the structural difficulties of having women's movements in this country and I think around the world is that it is, you know, it's incredibly difficult to talk about our frustrations with misogyny, sexism, and to challenge men and male power because we love men, we need men, we like men, we rely on men. It's very hard to have moments where we can actually be open about our frustrations, and it happens sort of every 60 years or something. And we're in that moment, and a conversation like Me Too opens a window for us to acknowledge our stories and all the things that we've sort of held inside and been told we're not really allowed to be angry about. And then when we start to let the anger out, we realize we're angry about other things too. And it might not fall under the category of sexual harassment, but as long as we got this Me Too mo window open, I'm just gonna stick that one in there too. And so that's part of what you're talking about is it's actually permitting us to express our anger about lots of things having to do with gendered and racial and class inequity. And a lot of stuff is getting stuffed in there and, or opened up rather, but we shouldn't worry about exactly what we call it. We should just be talking about all of it. Okay. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Rebecca, Sarah, and Ajahn, um, for really helping us set the stage to look at the cultural, the economic, and uh, the social dynamics, all of this through a lens of power. And I think we're ultimately talking about an entirely new power paradigm for the 21st century. Um, with that said, moving into the next conversation, which we're incredibly excited about, I'd like to welcome Alex Wagner to the, um, to the stage um, to come on up and come on up Toronto as well. Um, um, Alex is a correspondent for CBS, contributing editor for The Atlantic, co-host of The Circus, and also the recent author of Future Faces, um, family, a family mystery, an epic quest, and a servant, um, and a secret to, and the secret, sorry, the secret to belonging. Um, Alex, thank you so much for being here. And Toronto Burke, I have to say, personally on behalf of the entire Aspen Institute, we are so honored to have the founder of the oh. Me Too movement here on our stage. <laughs> So Toronto, we thank you. We thank honor you. your expertise, your generosity, your activism, and Alex and Toronto, it's all yours. Thank ha. you. <laughs> so I mean, for if you're if you're not clear on this, hashtag Me Too. The Me Too part of that began a long time ago. Well, mm -hmm. 2006, and you're the person that came up with Me Too. Yeah. Tell us, if you will, how you coined that phrase, and whether you see a difference between that Me Too and this Me Too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it, I have to say, as a person who has had this um, close to my heart for so long, it is, I have different moments with this, right? Yeah. I have different days with it. And some days I'm just like, this is, this is the most incredible thing that's ever happened. And other days I'm like, stop saying it. Not, <laughs> you're saying it wrong. You know, you're doing it wrong. Um, what it will, that's just honest. Well, let's I just dig deeper like on that. I'm, I'm about to yeah. tell you. So... Um, <laughs> um, it started really because I wasn't able to say me too, right? And that's the, um, I think the part that I try to come back to all the time in terms of being the generosity of this moment and how people really, you know, outside of my crankiness sometimes, people really do need to embrace it in as far and wide as possible because, um, because when I was in a moment of struggling and trying to figure out how to support uh, the young women, and particularly one young woman, but the young women who were around me, and I was afraid of my own story, really. I was afraid to tap into what it was. I was afraid to go to that part of my brain. Um, and having, when this child came to me and told me what had happened to her and, had, and she had been molested um, by her stepfather and it resonated with me. And if I had in that moment said that happened to me too, like I really wanted to, mm -hmm. it would have opened up some things I just wasn't ready to deal with. Um, and then as time moved on and these stories just were not one-offs. Right, they were coming from different directions and they covered such a wide spectrum of, of the whole spectrum of sexual violence. At some point it became about um, making a decision, right? Because when I thought about what I didn't have at that age, I didn't have anybody. I didn't have anybody who, I didn't even know that the type of sexual violence I experienced as a child happened to other people mm -hmm. until I read Maya Angelou. And then I was like, oh, there's two of us, right? Like there was not, it just wasn't in my realm, my realm of reality because nobody talked about it. Yeah. And so I could, you know, program my way through it. I could leadership development my way through it. I could do all of these different things with the young people I was working with to try to build them up. But the thing that I felt like they needed and is what I needed, which is to not feel alone, okay. right? Like as incredibly pervasive as we know sexual violence is and it touches every demographic you can name, it is also deeply isolating. Yeah. And it's such a, you know, a weird dichotomy to have. But, um, but yeah, it started from the need to make sure that these young people didn't feel isolated. And then, you know, because we're always surprising ourselves, <laughs> the, that work was great and it was successful and it was, and it was helpful to these young people. And almost by happenstance, and I'm sure it would have happened eventually anyway, but almost by happenstance, we introdu introduced the work to adults. Um, you know, I think people have probably heard the story. We, of, we created a MySpace page to have a website, not to do outreach, not to like reach the masses. That concept, social media was pretty new, so that right. concept was The fact that it's a MySpace page is yeah. carbon data. Right, exactly, like, yeah. Uh, so MySpace was still a thing. It was just like there was no you know, website tonight or whatever you call it. So we created it to just have a, something to say, hey, go look at our page, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. 
And then adults started responding, adult women, and we were like, this is of course, we are all, it was me, my girlfriend, and um, a young girl who, who came up, this is the, the one who connects me and I, Jen, who had come up through my program. Mm -hmm. And we were like, all three of us are survivors, why wouldn't other people need this? Yeah. And that, I think of that as the first time going viral, like the onslaught of people saying, thank you for starting this, and how can we bring it to our community? We were like, I don't know, we just, you know? And then we yeah. had to like figure that out. And so it's been that way. Um, but once we got that nugget, and then it became boys, you know, then we had, I, I had an instance of, I would do workshops with parents, and I had a father come and say, can you make something for boys? Because my son was molested, and I was like, oh, I was like, oh, this is totally for boys. And he was like, right. well, I, I can't tell, you know, it's all girls. So it was like, it just kept growing and growing and growing in terms of how we, um, who the we focus, talk to. The focus was very much on sexual violence. The focus was on sexual violence, right. absolutely. The, the expansion of that was only maybe street harassment. Okay. You know, we dealt with, we had campaigns around street harassment and, and like safety in your own body and your community. And so I, our young people did campaigns and stuff around that. But our work was specifically around sexual violence mm -hmm. um, and supporting survivors of sexual violence. We, as we talked about on the stage, or as Rebecca brilliantly moderated, <laughs> uh, the moment right now is a, a little bit bigger than just sexual violence, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or a lot bigger, depending yeah. on where you're standing. Is that a good thing for me too? So this, this is part of the challenge that we have right now is everybody trying to couch everything under me too. I was itching in my seat when that question was brought up in the last session because it does matter. It, we cannot couch everything under this. And it's, and it's because the more things, it's not about pay equity. It's not about having 50% of your workforce being, those are issues that I, that I value, that I support, but Nine months ago, millions of people around the world who are survivors of sexual violence, very specifically sexual violence, raised their hand to say, me too. And their hands are still raised because we haven't developed the mechanism, which we're doing, we're working as fast as we can, but we haven't developed an effective mechanism to, to answer that call. Right. We've been busy talking about the individuals. We've been busy talking about the predators and the backlash and the, all of these other issues. You're right, we get upset and we realize yeah, there's a whole bunch of shit in here that we should be talking about, <laughs> yeah. but that doesn't all rise to the, to the occasion, to the, to the level of saying me too. And I've had to fight this off as people who wanted to use, they, you know, me too pay and me too, there should be other me too's, right? There should be like me too military. There should be like me too K-12. But, you, but, but maybe not called but me not, too. No, I'm fine with it, as long as it's about sexual violence is what okay. I'm saying. Oh, I see what the, you're saying. The spectrum of sexual violence, but it shouldn't be like me too pay equity. Right? You think that's a separate issue? It's a separate issue. If you take away all the work that was done before 2017, take away, forget for a second that I, have any, that I have any background in this. What happened on October 15th was a tweet that went out that said, if you have been sexually assaulted yeah. or harassed, say me too. And I'm telling you that I talk to these people, hundreds of people a week. If you count online and offline, it's probably thousands. Mm -hmm. And they're, not ta they're, tr they're in pain and they're trying to find uh, some kind of recourse for what they're dealing with around sexual violence. Let me just push back on that a little bit because I sure. think that there are folks that will say, okay, but if we're trying to look at how to change this, mm -hmm. how do we prevent women from being uh, preyed upon? How do we prevent sexual violence? How, what, what can we do systemically in terms of institutions? One of the solutions people point to is we need more women in the room. Absolutely. You don't have to say me too right. to get no women in the room, though. Okay, but, but they, <laughs> fair enough. But they see the pay equity, greater gender parity. Mm -hmm. These are sort of outgrowths of the central question of how do you prevent violence and predation. This is, I, I agree with that. But this is about, to me, about us, we had a, a festival about creativity. This is about us not being imaginative enough. Mm -hmm. We get, I think, as a, as a culture, this is not about any individual person, we get a little lazy. And so Me Too comes along and it sparks something and it spreads like wildfire and people are like, whoo, we found something. So just put everything in there. Get as much in there as you can. You know? And I get it. I do get it. Yeah. Don't, don't get me wrong. I understand the, the, the reason why people want to do it. Is if they can get it out there and people will pay attention if you throw a hashtag on it, fine. I get that. But what I'm saying is that as a person who's doing the work and, and know other people who are doing this work, it's, it's hurtful to us. Yeah. It is hurting the work we're trying to do because you can't cover but so much, so many things and sexual violence is wide enough, yeah. right? We, you, 
I don't want to spend time having to, these are my comrades. These are the people who are looking for pay equity and looking for to get more women. Those are my comrades. Those are people who I want to support and whose work does work in tandem with what we're doing. Yeah. But it just, it creates a challenge when we have to keep saying, well, that's not, that's not what we're here for. We're here for this. Oh, that's not what we're here for. We're here for this. You understand what I'm saying? Let me, let me ask you a sort of related question, which is, as a journalist, um, I think one of the reasons, and I'm being hashtag real talk on this, that <laughs> okay. the, the Me Too <laughs> moment that started in 2017 mm. took off and got so much coverage is because it went to the centers of power mm. and wealth mm. and also race. It was wealthy white women, wealthy ma males, white males who were involved in all of this, yep. right? Has the movement or has the hashtag, whatever you want to call it, been inclusive enough when it comes to low-income Americans, mm -hmm. low-income people, and people of color? Here's another thing we need clarity about. The hashtag is not a movement, right? The work that we're doing on the ground, what iGen is doing, what I'm doing, what the people who, are, who, are, who have been doing this work for a long time are doing to, to, to support those people who raise their hands, that's a movement. The mistake that we're making is that we're allowing, and I have to disagree with what you said about this being a happy moment. I think the journalism that came up, that, that, that produced the moment was amazing. Mm -hmm. And I agree with that part. I think the journalism that's happened after it has not been supported. What, why? I think the journalism that has happened afterwards has tried to categorize this movement as something that it's not. I hope I don't sound aggressive. Do I sound aggressive? No, you know what? Stop, don't worry about being polite. <laughs> oh, I don't care about being yeah. polite. But you know, people will be like, I still had to ask when I did this thing and she was so aggressive, but. <laughs> I was on a 15-hour flight yesterday, so. No, no. You don't have to go by it. You can go ahead but, and say. But I think that what, because it's so, it's so um, frustrating every day that what journalism does, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example because people send me this stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. I got a screenshot the other day of an article that started off and said, the Me Too movement wants Stephen A. Smith to apologize for flirting with something. I don't know the situation, right? Right. So that's dumb. Let's start with that. <laughs> that's the, it, it, what, what the media is doing now is it personifies this movement and it, cre and it blames it for everything. And so anything that happens, with anything where a woman raises her voice, just to be straight up and down, if a woman raises her voice to say, to push back against any idea, be like, look what the Me Too movement is doing. Mm -hmm. That's not right. And it also is unfair to women who have been raising their voices, right? right. Now all of a sudden you can only be heard or understood or seen if it's, this label is this, this lens. And so the media is not doing a great job. And if you, if you believe or you define this movement by what the media tells you it is, mm -hmm. then no, black women, women of color, disabled people, queer people, trans people, none of us are included, but we never have been. There's never been a time in our history where the media has used by its own benevolence, raised the issues of the marginalized communities to elevate our stories, to help, that's not what happens, right? Or your it's to their Definitely not. It's only to their benefit. And so, no, to your original question, no. We're being left out. If you define the movement in that way, yeah, we are certainly being left out. And that's another failure, I think, of journalism, of that if I was a journalist right now, I would go crazy to so many stories to tell. There's so many different ways to look at this. I would be looking at, how does sexual violence happen in the black community different in other communities? Yeah. What's going on with trans women and sexual violence, right? Disabled communities, and like there's so many different angles that you can take, but instead they're like, let's follow Harvey Weinstein some more. Let's, well, I mean, know. I don't know that the media is gonna stop doing that, but they're they, not. But, but, but they but, certainly but that's could do my point, more. Though. Yeah. But that's my point. If we wait for the media to tell our stories, if yeah. we wait, wait for the media to define this movement and we follow what the media says, we will never get this work done and those hands will stay raised. Um, mm -hmm. Just to, to go back to the framing a little bit because I noticed this is, this is something that comes up continually actually even since last year, mm -hmm. which is that we continue to talk about sexual violence in the context of men and not at, in the context of the women. Mm -hmm. How do you do that in a way that is respectful to victims who often don't want to come forward and have, or for whom coming forward is difficult, right? How do you do it in a way that is responsible and puts the sort of focus on the victims? On the survivors. Uh, on so, the survivors. So wait, you're saying how do we allow... How do we talk about this in a way that it's not about the men, but it's about the women? or 
the survivors if it's not women? Well, the thing is, there's so many, you know, it's not a monolith like anything else, right? And so there are some survivors who are quite comfortable in speaking out loud and quite comfortable with standing up and, 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 and we should allow that to happen. I think the problem is when we try to force people to either tell their stories or to stand up and be right, that, that's not okay. But for the pe there's enough people out here who are survivors of sexual violence who are, you can't shut them up. Mm -hmm. We could get people, you know, allow them the space to talk about it and to share their stories and their, their firsthand experiences. And I agree, it's, we do center the men um, in, the, in, the, in the situations where it's men and women, we center the men and we center the accused or the perpetrators all the time. And, you know, even when you think about Weinstein and the women that he, um, who came forward about them, we don't even really know what they're going through. There are no articles written about, you know, how is Mira Savino surviving right now? It was, there was like a little article, the article the Times did about, I thought it was beautiful actually, about Annabella Sciorra. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I was so grateful that they, somebody paid attention because as much as it is about white women in Hollywood and they're famous and that's why I got, why I got so much attention, even those white women don't get, you know what I mean? Like at right. the end of the day, white men at the top of the at the top of the right. food chain, and so there's this there's this need for us, this frenzy around, you know, well, Harvey Weinstein's hiding out in the Hamptons, and he's wearing a, who can, nobody cares about that. Yeah. What, what I want to know is, well, some people do, but yes. I mean, in a, in a sort of like I'm gonna read it for five minutes on page six, right. but I, but if I'm gonna do if you're gonna do in depth right. reporting, right. Somebody should be talking about how these women's lives are being pulled back together or if they are, because those of us who are not celebrities need to read that. Right. Um, I, I wonder how much, I wanna, we're gonna go to the audience in a couple minutes, so start the wheels oh. turning. <laughs> um, how much, when you talk about the momentum this movement has, mm. some people will say, one of the drivers behind this movement is the commander in chief. He exists as a sort of, well, right, you're rolling your eyes. I mean, there's probably plenty of eye rolls in this audience, but his history with sexual violence or alleged sexual violence, uh, his behaviors, his attitudes towards gender equity, gender parity, women, et cetera, mm -hmm. these are so, um, women in this country, many people in this country cannot abide by that. And mm. so whatever levers there exist, the opening of the sort of Me Too hashtag, mm. the movement writ large, this is the way that sort of rage is being channeled and mm. a desire to see change. Is that a bad thing for the long-term sort of health, the long-term momentum of this movement, or is that a good thing? I think, I mean, we always have different drivers, right? There's any, any movement, if it was the civil rights movement or any movement you have, there's usually some driver that, has, that gets people motivated. Uh, there's nothing wrong with righteous rage. And, and if righteous rage is, what pe which is, what, is what's galvanizing people in this moment, absolutely. And what's, what'll happen is what always happens. There'll be some people, people who um, rise up in this moment because they're so angry and this is like a bridge too far and they will contribute as much as they can, or whatever, and they'll fall off. Mm -hmm. this, this is not their commitment. This is not their life's commitment. And the rest of us, what they do is they bolster the work for the rest of us who have made a lifelong commitment mm -hmm. to this. And so I don't, I, you know, it's, to me it's just like when people get upset with, um, this is a new thing I just sort of came to recently, <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm not mad anymore when like men say, oh, I really support, I get this every day. I really support your movement because I have a daughter and I have right. a wife. And I used to be like, I mean, are, were they not human before this movement? <laughs> but, but. But I will say that my, I'm coming around around that because whatever your entry point is, mm -hmm. I don't care. Right. We just need you. Right. We need you in this fight and we need you in the work. So if, if you are so disgusted by Trump as you should be, <laughs> um, then, and if that's what gets you up off your couch and out in the streets, if it gets you writing checks, if yeah. it gets you making calls, I'm okay with that. The movement will be sustained. This movement never stopped. Right. Me Too didn't start something. We are part of a continuous movement that has been happening for years and years and years. This, there are enough of us in this world, in this country, in this whatever, that are going to sustain this work as long as we have breath in our bodies. And every now and again, if we get a bump up because people are angry, I'll take that. Right. And, and you know what? People used to say, what are you gonna do a year from now when nobody's hashtagging Me Too? And I'm like, well, the one, same thing I've been doing. That's number one. But also, so many millions of people were um, sort of awakened in this moment around mm -hmm. sexual violence. Mm -hmm. Even survivors who have who feel emboldened, who feel like they have a place. 
if, it's, if a mil, let's just say it was only a million people, if we only had 1% of that a year from now, if we had 100,000 more people out on the ground who are doing work and committed to ending sexual violence, that's a win. Right. I'll take that. <laughs> I can't recruit. What could I do? Like, what could I have done in September of last year to recruit 100,000 people to come join me in this work to end sexual violence? Not much. Right. So I'll take it. You know, it's a, it's a lot of work to get a little bit, but I'll take it. <laughs> um, I just have one question for you before Please. we go to the audience. <laughs> Th this is, and like, bless all of you for coming to this. It is, I think, I'm not a statistician, but I think it's overwhelmingly <laughs> female, but there are some yeah. men in the audience. I see a couple brothers out here. Props to all of you for coming to this. <laughs> what do you tell men in this moment? Oh, God. I, I, is this, being, this is being filmed. Look at yeah. this back. <laughs> this is like the question I hate the most. Right? Well, I'm sorry, but I, it's Toronto, okay. It's but not. It's not your fault. Yeah. I get it. Um, the messenger. Because because so this is what I say to men. I say a couple of things. One, I have to start off always by acknowledging that men are survivors too. Yep. And we have to make space for men to be vulnerable and to have and have and feel like they are a part of this moment as well, and that they can talk about, get help for, be supported in their survivorship. So this is not a woman's movement, it's a survivor's movement. So I say that first to men. Um, but we also know that there's a, this dynamic of men and women, is, 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 this is driven largely by the dynam dynamic between men and women. And I think that I tell men that you need to have patience and courage in this moment. And you need to have patience because to your point, this is uh, so many, particularly young women who have not, this is their first time around with mm -hmm. some of this, right? Um, have not had an opportunity to speak out loud, to say the things that they've been holding in the pit of their stomach out loud and be believed, to be heard and believed and seen. Um, some of us may go a little crazy, right? That's fine. I feel like it's gonna settle, right? I think that you give people, give people the space to kind of like get it out and, um, and stop saying, not me. Well, not me, right? Because if not you, then the guy next to you. And if it's not you, then th interrogate yourself. Interrogate how you live and how you move through the world. You may be a great guy, wonderful dad, blah, 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 blah. Do you laugh at rape jokes? You know? Do you allow the guy, you, you know, you, the friend you have, well, he's just boorish, that's how he is, you know, whatever. Right. That's Bob, that's how he is. Do you allow that or do you check Bob? So I think men have to be patient with us to, um, to watch this happen, be patient, learn, listen deeply, and learn. And don't try to, uh, what is it? Don't try to push back right away, right? Just learn something. And then have some courage. You know, you, somebody has to be the first person to say, Bob, those jokes are not funny. Like, and you, use your daughters, use your wives. Just be like, hey, I have a daughter, that's not funny. Or whatever it is. But men need to have a little more courage. Um, we, we don't dislike you, we love you. <laughs> like, that's another misconception. We love men, this is not an anti-man movement. This is a pro-self movement. It is, a, it is a movement about wanting to be able to walk through life, as the sister said, and own your body and have body autonomy and not have to release that for anybody else, whether you're a man or woman or what have you. So that's my tips to men. Just, just be patient, have some courage, and stop letting Bob get away with nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Did I? Okay. I totally ran over my time. That's my fault. I'm a bad moderator. We have time for like two, one moderator. or two questions. Uh, in the back, right there in the green. Hi, hi how's it going, everybody? Hi. Uh, my name is Jessica Disu. I'm an organizer activist from Chicago. All right. Um, I kind of have two questions. But no, I'm only ask, ask one. one. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, so we've seen like, you know, Me Too take off, you know, against like, you know, wealthy white men, a lot of wealthy white women have spoken out mm -hmm. about it. But how can we, um, I guess, push for, I guess, accountability for women who are more marginalized, for mm -hmm. like domestic workers, like who work in homes or like McDonald's or things like that. Well, I'm sure yeah. they're being harassed as well. So how do we push back? Because it seems to me it's like the movement the with the hashtag going viral and stuff, it's able to um, threaten people who are in high positions, who are sitting on the top of the mountain, mm -hmm. if you will. They're highly visible. Whereas what does it do for the everyday people? That's all work, right? This is kind of a, a continuation of what, what we was talking about earlier in terms of the media. We we. What happened with the media and the coverage of Me Too, I fully expect it to happen. 
What happens after that is our work. And so what, what we have to do is we have to organize. We know that the thing that's, I guess, frustrating for me is that for those of us who live in these commu marginalized communities who are organizers and activists, whatever, or who are not, but are concerned citizens, whatever you are, we see that it happens right around us all day, every day. We live in it, we experience it, but we don't feel validated enough to say anything until the media says we can. And so we have to stop waiting for them to tell our story and validate it and know and understand that it is happening and, and do the work around ending that, organizing in our own community. So the hashtag may not ever hold the, you know, the store owner accountable or, the, or, what, or what have you, but we can hold them accountable. We can organize in our own communities. We can, part of the work that we're doing now is building a model to help people to, to, to do community action because it's not gonna come from this, these other folks. It's gonna come from us, it's self, uh, what is it, self, Generated? Generated, there you go, thank you. It's sort of self-generated, right. This is a movement from the bottom up. And so part of my pushback a lot of times when, I, when I'm in um, communities of color, mostly black communities, here, like, well, what, why black women are left out of me too? And I'm like, you're not left out of anything. You are left out of the mainstream media, but they've never covered you. So you can't look at me as black as I am and tell me that you're left out of something that I started for us. So you need to take don't let them take our power from us. That's, that's really the, prob, the, thing, the challenge I have. We, t we re relinquish our power so easily. Oh, well, this ain't for us because they're not talking about it. Forget them. We have to do the work in our own communities. That, what's this, you know the poem. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Mm -hmm. And we have a moment right now where people are listening and people are paying attention, and it's not going to look like the front of the New York Times or the, or the Post. Or the, it's not going to look like that. And we have to be okay with that anyway and still do the work. <laughs> That's my auntie, y'all. Okay, one more, one more. Right there. Sorry, I went to that side twice. Hi, my name is Alex. Uh, first of all, just really want to thank you for the amazing and important work that you're doing. You, um, I work for Catalyst, which is the leading nonprofit focused on advancing women and minorities at work. And so my organization is focused on all of those things that you're saying are not part of Me Too, pay equity, advancing women, mm -hmm. all of that. Um, and you called us comrades, which I love. And I just want to hear from you what we can do to more effectively partner together. How can we be a part of this work to, you know, a rising tide lifts all shifts? Absolutely. Right? I think that, um, so, you know, my girl Ijen is here in the front. And one of the things, one of the, I think she would agree with this, one of the biggest lessons that we got this year was about the ways that we can work collectively without erasing, uh, being erased, right? Erasing our work, erasing our movement, erasing our goals. And so there's a group of us, there's a little a growing group of us now of, 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 of women leaders mostly from around the country and they cover everything from farm workers to domestic workers to restaurant workers to women and girls, like different issues. And what we do is we, one, one we talk and listen to each other and when, we, um, when we're thinking about solutions, we think about all of, this, all of us are affected by the same things. Capitalism, patriarchy, all of those things affect no matter what your social justice issue is. And so we have sort of a, our eye on the prize and the ways that we can support each other. So for instance, domestic workers looking for, if you're looking for um, pay equity, we know if you get paid more, then you're less worried about being sexually harassed, right? And so that ties into our work. Um, we also know that if you have, you're, if you're doing work around domestic workers and they're largely women, a good number of them are gonna be survivors, so they need to be supported. So I think we have to look at the ways that we, our work intersects and overlaps, and in the places that it doesn't, be supportive of each other. It's really, it's not a hard thing. We just have to kind of take our egos out of it a little bit and know that everybody gets a turn. Everybody gets a turn, but you were first. Always. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you so much, Alex, and thank you, Tarana. Um, I think one theme that I want to just lift from that conversation among many is let's really, how do we think about allyship and how do we think about it across sectors, across strategies, across race, across borders, across generation? Because when we think about a power paradigm, how are we always thinking about expanding it and connecting it and sharing it and lifting it with others? So um, just thank you, really great. Um, so now it's my pleasure with no further ado to introduce um, Kim Parker, the Director of Social Trends for the Pew Research Center. Kim, come on up. Okay, well, those are a couple of hard acts to follow, but I'll try to, <laughs> try to keep you guys entertained. We're going to do something a little bit different this session, and I hope that you'll enjoy it and find it informative. So we've talked a little bit about how the Me Too movement got started, and we've talked about some of the vulnerable groups that are affected by sexual harassment and, and also the broader issue of power dynamics in this country. And we've covered a lot of ground, but we haven't really talked very much about where the public stands. What, what is the public experiencing? What are public attitudes on these issues more broadly? So that's where I come in. I do surveys for a living. I work at the Pew Research Center, as Anne mentioned, and I'm the director of social trends research. And in that capacity, we study a whole range of issues, looking at important trends that are shaping the country and how those are playing out in people's lives. And we spent a lot of time over the last year looking at gender, not just at Me Too and sexual harassment, but also more broadly at the changing roles that men and women are playing in society and at attitudes about gender discrimination. And as I mentioned, we take a lot of surveys, and today you all are going to get to become part of the research. So we're going to do some live polling on these issues. I've picked out a few questions from some surveys that we've done over the last year where we can see how the room feels about this, and then we'll compare it to the views of the public. I'll be looking down some, because that's where I'm going to see your votes tallying up. This is a little like American Idol or um, you know, one of those live voting shows. So I've never done this before, so let's hope it goes smoothly. It'll be fun. Um, so just a couple of caveats about live polling. Since I'm a researcher, I have to try to get this out there. This is meant to be fun and informative, but it's not scientific. So uh, I think as Alex pointed out, the room is not um, balanced in terms of gender. So this is not a representative sample of Americans. We, we don't have balance in gender, race, educational attainment, or um, age, and those are all things that we take into account when we do our big public studies. We weight our samples to make sure that they look just like the general public would on these broad demographic characteristics. So that's just to say, not scientific, but still hopefully fun and informative. And also the questions that I'm going to ask you come from a few different surveys that we've conducted, so the context in which you'll be getting the questions is a little bit different than our general public respondents did. Um, so now that we've got that out of the way, are you ready to get started? Okay, the first thing I need you guys to do is take out your cell phones. Um, I'm going to put a little information up here for you. I need you to um, open up your messaging app wherever you would normally send a text message, and the number that you're going to be texting is 22333, and the message that you're going to put in to start out is Aspen. So put that message in, press send. Hopefully, you'll get an automated response saying that you've joined the session. And once you get that message, you're in. So I'll give you guys a minute to figure that out. If you don't want to participate or if you're having technical difficulties, don't worry about it. Just sit back and, and enjoy. OK, is anyone getting the message saying they're in? Great. OK, so this first question is going to tap into your own personal experiences. This is obviously a sensitive topic, and I just want to ensure everybody that your responses are completely anonymous. We're not going to save the data. We can't link it to you via your phone or anything like that. So here we go. Have you ever personally received unwanted sexual advances or verbal or physical harassment of a sexual nature? This can be in any circumstance whether or not it was work-related. So if your answer is yes, I want you to type A and press send. If your answer is no, type B and press send, and we should be able to see the responses tallying on the screen. Uh -oh. I'm looking back at our technical gurus. Why 
one thing I'll, I'll just kill a little time here. Even um, just writing these kinds of questions can be very tricky, and there's different ways that you can ask about people's own experiences with sexual harassment. And different polling organizations have asked it in different ways and got different responses. So that's kind of interesting to note, too. This question was, we tried to develop it to be um, pretty general in nature so that we could capture a lot of different experiences. I can tell you what we found when we asked the public this. Um, and then maybe later I'll tell you what we found in the room. But uh, we found that 44% of all Americans said that they had had this type of experience. OK, here we go. Maybe this is going to work. Yes. Oh my gosh. Wow. OK. So 79% of the people in this room say that they have received unwanted sexual advances of a verbal or physical nature, or verbal or physical harassment of a sexual nature. So that is um, different from what we found when we asked the public. As I mentioned, we found that 44% um, of all Americans said that they had had this type of experience. A narrow majority, 56%, said that they had not had this type of experience. And not surprisingly, women are more likely than men to say that they had experienced this type of harassment. 59% uh, of women compared with 27% of men. We also found an interesting educational gap among women. So women with some college experience are more likely to say that they have experienced sexual harassment than women who never attended college. And that sort of dovetails a little bit with what we found in a separate survey where we asked specifically about sexual harassment in the workplace and whether it's a problem where you work. And there we found that the responses really varied by industry. So, and we've heard a lot about this in the media, particularly about the tech industry. And we found that women who work in male-dominated industries, such as engineering or computers and tech, were much more likely than women who work in female-dominated industries, such as healthcare, to say that, they had ex that sexual harassment was a problem where they work. OK, so now I want to switch gears a little bit and think about the implications of the Me Too movement for women and for men. So this will be your, your next question coming up on the screen. In the long run, do you think the increased focus on sexual harassment and assault will lead to more opportunities for women in the workplace, fewer opportunities for women in the workplace, or won't it make much of a difference? It's kind of fun to see how it jumps around. Let's see when it settles. OK, so it looks like a majority in the room think that this increased attention to sexual harassment and assault will lead to more, and more job opportunities for women in the future. That, again, is a little bit different from what we found when we asked the public. <laughs> the public is a little more skeptical about what this all means for women. We found that 51% of Americans said that um, it won't make much of a difference, this increased um, attention to sexual harassment and assault. About a, 3 in 10 said that it'll lead to more opportunities, but 1 in 5, 20% said that it'll actually lead to fewer opportunities for women in the future. Now here we found that men and women's opinions were almost identical, which is really interesting since this is a question specifically about the impact on women. But we found a big party gap on this question. Um, Democrats are much more optimistic about how this is all going to turn out for women. About 4 in 10 Democrats and independents who lean to the Democratic Party said that the increased focus on sexual harassment and assault will lead to more opportunities for women in the workplace. And only 15% of Republicans held that view. For their part, a majority of Republicans th thought that this really wouldn't make much of a difference. But one in four Republicans thought that this will actually make things worse for women in terms of their job opportunities. And I just want to stick with this um, theme of party breaks for a second, because this brings up something that I want to highlight for you, and you're going to see it throughout some of the other questions that we're going to ask. And the story about Americans' attitudes and experiences with sexual harassment, and more broadly with gender equality, is just as much a political story as it is a gender story. The party gaps that we see between Republicans and Democrats are as wide, and in some cases wider, than the differences we see between men and women. And I think that this really speaks to the political polarization in the country and highlights the fact that that polarization extends to issues surrounding gender. And you'll see as I go on, there's some other 
really big party differences as well. Now, what about the impact that the Me Too movement is having on men and their experiences in the workplace? Do you think the increased focus on sexual harassment and assault has made it easier or harder for men to know how to interact with women in the workplace? Or hasn't it made much of a difference? Still coming in. Okay, it looks like it's settling a little bit. Okay, so a majority of you, women and men, think that this has made it harder for men to know how to interact with women in the workplace. About 20% say it's made it easier, and 19% say it hasn't made much of a difference. This is kind of similar to what we found with the public. We found a plurality or almost a majority saying that, it, that this has made it harder for men to know how to interact, about a third saying it hasn't made much of a difference, and 12% saying that it's made it easier. So on this question, there is a bit of a gender gap. Men are somewhat more likely than women to say that this heightened attention to these issues has made it harder for them to know how to interact with women in the workplace, 55% of men versus 47% of women. Again, big party gap on this question. So Republicans especially think that this has made it harder for men to know how to interact. 64% said that compared with 42% of Democrats. Okay, now I want to take a step back a little bit from looking at sexual harassment and the Me Too movement to look a little bit at how society's expectations of men and women play into all of this. So I want to ask you a few questions about the pressures that men and women face today. So first I'm going to ask you a couple questions about women and then a couple questions about men. So first, thinking about women, in general, how much pressure, if any, do you think women face in our country these days to be successful in their job or career? Would you say A, a lot, B, some, C, not too much, or D, none at all? We have a lot of working women in the room, I'm guessing. <laughs> okay, so it looks like it's gonna come out that a pretty solid majority say that women face a lot of pressure these days to be successful in their job or career. A um, Little different from what we found when we asked the public. Oops. Oh wait, okay, we'll go, to, we'll go to the next question, then we'll talk about the public. So how much pressure, if any, do you think women face in our country these days to be physically attractive? Would you say a lot, some, not too much, or none at all? I have to remember this for later, okay. Okay, so women are feeling pressured from all sides, I guess. So a lar very large majority, almost everybody, says that women face a lot of country in our a lot of pressure in our country these days to be physically attractive. We've got it at 93 percent, um, and nobody thinks that women don't face pressure in this area. Okay, let's see what the next slide is going to show. Okay, so here you can see how the public answered these questions. We had a large majority agreeing with the room that women face a lot of pressure to, feel, to be physically attractive, but fewer than half saying that women face a lot of pressure to be successful in their job or career. Okay, now let's think, ask these same questions, but thinking about men. And just to point out in terms of polling, we would never ask the questions in this order because I'm leading you down a specific path. We would be randomizing and splitting the samples and things like that, but we'll just do it this way. So in general, how much pressure, if any, do you think men face in our country these days to be successful in their job or career? So it looks like a big majority here saying that men face a lot of pressure to be successful in their job or career, about 80%. Is that similar to what we found with women in this room, but not, not necessarily with the public? 
Okay, so here we can see what the public said on the job front. 68% of Americans said men face a lot of pressure to be successful in their job or career, compared with 44% who said the same about women. Now, what about pressure to be physically attractive for men? How much pressure, if any, do you think men face in this country these days to be physically attractive? <laughs> I don't, don't think about it for too long. Okay. Okay, not so much, huh? <laughs> some, some. So only 7% say men face a lot of pressure in this area. 28% say some, and the rest of you think um, not too much or not at all. Okay, so let's see how we compare to the public. Okay, so similarly, Americans don't really think that men face a lot of pressure when it comes to being physically attractive. They do think men face a lot of pressure, that women face a lot of pressure in this area. So you can see here that the public, uh, other than the finding on being successful in their job or career, where, where this audience is much different from the public, the pattern that we found in the public was that men face pressure on the job front, women face pressure to be physically attractive, and, and significant gaps there. Um, we found similar questions when we asked, we found similar findings when we asked about the pressure that women face to be involved parents, women and men, and to be financial providers. So there we found again that the public thinks women face more pressure to be successful parents and less pressure than men to be financial providers. And I think all of these findings are particularly striking when we think of them in the context of women's changing role in the labor force and women's changing role as family financial providers. So we know from our research that women make up half of the labor force today, 47%. Women are just as likely as men today to be working in managerial occupations and have access to more lucrative occupations that they didn't in the past. And also, I think with this was mentioned before, women are outpacing men right now in educational attainment by a pretty significant margin. And in four in 10 households with children, our research has found that women are the sole or primary breadwinners in those households. So women's roles in the labor force and in terms of being family financial providers are somewhat out of sync with what the public says the expectations for women are. And I think that's an important, important context for this whole debate. So now I want to think a little bit bigger picture even. Um, we're going to think a little bit about what life is like for men and women in the country these days. So your next question is, all things considered, I don't know how we have results up there already. Um, who do you think has it easier in our country these days, men or women? I'm not sure where the 82% is coming from. Um, but anyways, so say 82% said that. Um, the public thinks that there really isn't much of a difference in terms of who has it easier or harder. We found that 56% of Americans said there wasn't any difference, but among those who do see a difference, the balance tilts towards men having an easier life than women, 35% versus 9%. And we found a gender gap on this question, not surprisingly, with women more likely than men to say that men have easier lives these days, 41% versus 28%. And we found a really interesting generational gap here among women. So millennial women, that is women who were 18 to 36 last year when we conducted this poll, are significantly more likely than older generations of women to say that men have easier lives these days. And that's interesting to me because these are the very women who are outpacing their male counterparts by a lot in educational attainment. They're also closing the gender wage gap with men their age. Um, there's women and men in this age cohort are almost at parity in terms of wages. It separates as women get older and take on more family responsibilities and whatnot. But it's just interesting to note that millennial women who do have a different set of circumstances that they're facing in the labor force are feeling that men have easier lives more so than older generations of women. Okay, and now one last question. This one is about the country more generally, more broadly, and the progress that's been made or not made in terms of getting gender equality. So when it comes to giving women equal rights with men, do you think the, this country has gone too far, has not gone far enough, or has been about right? A for too far, B for not far enough, and C for been about right. Is this one not working? Maybe we can do a show of hands for this one. Okay. 
How many think the country's gone too far in trying to bring about equal rights for women in this country? Anybody? Too far? Okay. That's not a surprise. <laughs> okay, how many think the country hasn't gone far enough? Okay, anybody think the progress has been about right? Anybody willing to say? Okay, okay. got one in the back. Okay, so it looked like we had about 99% of the room saying that the country hasn't gone far enough in terms of bringing about gender equality for women. A little different from what we found when we asked the public, but similar sentiment. So we found that half of Americans think the country hasn't gone far enough in bringing about gender equality. 40%, almost 39% say the progress has been about right, and one in 10 actually think that things have gone too far in bringing about gender equality for women. So again, we found a gender gap on this question. Um, not an enormous gap, but women more likely than men by a margin of 57 to 42 to say that the country hasn't gone far enough in bringing about gender equality. Men more likely than women to say the progress has been about right. And relatively few of both genders say that we've gone too far, but men are slightly more likely to say that. We found a really big party gap, and this goes back to my earlier point about this being a political story and reflecting polarization in the country. Democrats are about almost three times as likely as Republicans to say the country has not gone far enough in bringing about equal rights for women. Um, a majority of Republicans, a narrow majority, think the progress has been about right, but almost one in five Republicans think that we've gone too far, and that sentiment is felt more strongly among Republican men than among Republican women. And I just want to point out, too, that part of what we're finding, seeing here is compositional, so we know that there's a higher concentration of women in the Democratic Party than there is in the Republican Party, but even when you control for that and you look at differences among women and among, or di gender differences, no, party differences among women and among men, you see them. So Republican women are actually closer to Republican men in their views on these issues than they are to Democratic women, which I think is really interesting. Yeah. So, so that's the last question I have for you. And, and um, I'd be happy to take a couple questions. I just have a few kind of comments to wrap up on what we've learned. So we've talked a little bit about how often sexual harassment happens. Um, how people think the Me Too movement will impact men and women going forward, and also about some of the broader views on, on gender and how those factor into the current debate. And in some cases, as I've kind of pointed out along the way, the views in this room are similar to what we find in the general public, but in some cases they were quite different, and I think the most obvious one was the finding about the pressure that women face to be successful in their jobs or careers. The public just really doesn't see it that way. Um, the public is very much sort of stuck in an, 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 al an alternative viewpoint about the roles of men and women and, and women's responsibilities in the workplace. So um, just a couple of key takeaways as I see them um, from this research and from what we've learned here today. We can see that there are pretty, pretty significant divides on this issue. There's not consensus about any of this really. We saw gender divides, we saw class divides with the differences by educational groups and women, and we also obviously saw party divides and talked a lot about those. And I think in terms of assessing where we are as a country in terms of gender equality, it's really important to keep in mind that while the public strongly favors equality for women and men, um, we found 82% say it's very important for women to have equal rights with men. At the same time, the public sees men and women as fundamentally different on a whole variety of dimensions when it comes to how they express their feelings, when it comes to their physical abilities, when it comes to the ways in which they approach parenting. The public sees real differences between men and women, and they don't think that that's a bad thing. So I think that um, women are still viewed very much as nurturers among the general public and men as providers, and that's just sort of where we are in its important context as we have these debates. So I think that the public is certainly in favor of equality, and we see that in our polling results, but there's really no public consensus yet on what that might actually look like. So, yes? I'm wondering if you all are going to start expanding this beyond men and women to, to account for the fact mm. that so many people are, don't conform to any mm -hmm. gender to, to get... 
like yep. better results? Of what yeah, that's a great question. And you know, since we're dealing with samples in, in our surveys of a few thousand people, we don't end up capturing enough people in that category in order to be able to break them out separately. But we are exploring in our basic identification questions, giving people alternative ways to identify their gender. And we're actually embarking on a whole new line of research studying teens and their attitudes and experiences, and that will be particularly relevant, I think, for that population, and we'll definitely be doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. My question is actually about movement in these attitudes. Have you, if you've been, have you been doing this polling steadily over the past nine months, um, and have you, or, I mean, since, the fall of 2016, I, because right. I know I have seen some polling that has shown, aside from the raw numbers, shifts in attitudes. Is that something you've been mm -hmm. tracking? And can yeah, you tell we us? haven't been tracking it over you know a series of months. We have we have studied these issues over some series of years and have seen the public moving somewhat towards a more progressive set of viewpoints, but very slowly when it comes to these sort of more entrenched attitudes about gender roles. Um, and we'll be doing, you know, we'll be repeating some of these questions in the future and definitely tracking how opinion is changing. We, I don't have data that would suggest any change since, say, early 2017 on these issues. Um, but we, yeah, we'll, it, these are the kind of things that we track over time. Yeah. Oh, over here. Uh, hi, my name is Amy. I'm a Bezo scholar. I'm from hi. Chicago, and um, I was just wondering: Do you ever ask about like the type of job they have? Because I know sometimes in more competitive jobs, women sometimes can get a little bit. Um, it's not as supportive, you know, as the, like some communities of women are very, very supportive, and um, sometimes in more competitive jobs, it can they can lose that um, tight knit community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually did a big study this year on women and minorities in STEM occupations, and we had a large sample. We were able to look at real differences across occupations for both STEM workers and non-STEM workers, and that's where that one finding that I mentioned about women who work in male-dominated industries have a different set of experiences and attitudes in the workplace, especially around these issues of sexual harassment, than women who work in female-dominated industries or workplaces. And it's surprising how few women report that they work in gender balanced workplaces. So that was really interesting. Yeah. Is that it? Okay. I guess that's all we have time for, but thanks sorry for the glitches on the technology. Oh, thanks. Oh, thanks. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Kim. Um, just two quick things I want to ask you, Link, you walk out of here. I think Kim said some things that are really important, that 51% don't think that the Me Too movement is going to make a difference. And that's not really okay. So as you walk out of here, think about action, accountability, interrogation. And please join me in thanking our phenomenal panel, Tarana, Alex, Rebecca, Sarah, Ajahn, Kim. You all are amazing. Thank you. <laughs>